I work at the European Commission. So the first thing I would like I would like to say that I appreciated uh, the, the last presentation in the previous uh, uh, session, and I would like to add to that that much of what we see has to do, and uh, the presenter indirectly uh, suggested that, with the, the gradual eclipse of the importance of the Commission and the increasingly larger importance of the Council and of the intergovernmental process uh, there. Second, there was an important discussion at the end of that previous uh, session, and I, I would like to add something to this and link it with my presentation now. Uh, regarding central banks, the you know, contracts between national central banks, the European Central Bank, etc. The only way a larger supranational central bank can work is when it comes to existential type crisis, if the country that deals with an existential type crisis feels that it is treated by the new supranational central bank in ways that are similar to the way it would have been treated by its own central bank that it largely uh, relinquished uh, when moving to a uh, common currency. That is the litmus test. And whether we will move to more integration or less integration, as uh, some in the audience suggested, depends largely on this whether the European level institutions, when member states are faced with existential type threats, regardless of how large or small these states are, they feel that they are dealt with in a way that does not uh, make them substantially <laughs> more threatened than they would be uh, otherwise. Connecting it now with my presentation. Why do we have this problem with the European Central Bank? And uh, I think indirectly it was alluded to, but uh, perhaps needs pointing out. The European Central Bank, unlike the US uh, Federal Reserve, and unlike most national uh, central banks, has a unique mandate focusing on, on price stability. The US Federal Reserve has a uh, two-legged uh, mandate, second leg being uh, employment. Uh, you can call it uh, you know, looking uh, uh, toward boosting growth, uh, employment. There must be, or there usually is, either explicitly or implicitly, a second leg uh, to uh, the mandate of central banks. In this, the, the case of the European Central Bank, it is uh, exclusively uh, price stability. And moreover, in practice, this has been translated into a, a sort of atavistic, that's my term, um, emphasis on inflation and, and fears of inflation that draw back to experience from the 20s up to the 70s. Uh, we can go into that, uh, perhaps we will in my presentation tomorrow, which will be more practical. Today will be more theoretical. Um, I should uh, add two important preambles. Number one, what I will say in no way reflects the opinion of the European Commission. I'm here uh, on titre personnel, as they say in French. Uh, number one. Number two, uh, I don't know how the, the commercial bank reference got in there, but that's, uh, that, is a, that is an error. I'm, I'm, I'm not a, you know, I, I cannot claim to, to be a consultant for uh, any commercial bank in Greece or any other country. However, a part of my my bio that may be useful, perhaps more so in what we will discuss tomorrow, is that for two years I was economic advisor in the Prime Minister's office in Greece, 2011-2012, after the crisis erupted, so you cannot blame for anything. And uh, that's actually, that was through three Greek Prime Ministers. So, yeah, if you want to ask me about this, I'd be glad to, to respond. Now, going on to the more, you know, theoretically, or at least that's the way I perceived it, uh, presentation uh, of or act, comments rather than presentation of today. And since there, you know, we only have very few minutes, uh, what I will do is I will give you two or three basic points I would like you to <laughs> to remember, uh, even if you don't pay any attention to anything else I, I may say after those three points. Uh, number one, it is high time in more ways than one, not just because of the context, the crisis and post-crisis uh, you know, um, undertow we are still fighting against. Uh, even because of theoretical developments in the last uh, you know, 30 years or so, it is high time that there is uh, a strong challenge to what could be called neo laissez faire, I don't like the neoclassical term, neo laissez faire uh, orthodoxy or the Washington Consensus. That's a very standard way of calling it. It, was, it emerged in the 80s, more or less. It, it is still in use, uh, especially when it refers to uh, policy advice and, and, and policy making. Uh, number one. Number two, in providing or um, trying to pursue this challenge, we should focus 
we should uh, pursue uh, both of the avenues that are usually available. And very often I see people, very smart people, dedicated exclusively to either the one or the other. And I think both should be pursued. What are these two avenues? The first avenue, the one most often talked about, is the one that is external to the neo laissez faire Washington Consensus mainstream uh, economic uh, literature. So it's a, it's a parallel uh, exercise. You may call it evolutionary economics, you may call it what you will. It's almost a parallel universe. Uh, very interesting work done there, but uh, it's almost you know, incompatible, the dialogue of the death, when you try to have uh, the two uh, sides talk across the aisle. Uh, several eyes, actually, it's not just two sides, but several different sides, different parallel views of this. It's worth pursuing, but it shouldn't be the only one. The other, the other one that should be pursued is the work, very critical work, that has been done in the last several decades already within the mainstream paradigm. I can, I can mention, if I have time, I would mention uh, a few such examples. So a two-pronged approach, if you will. The third point I would like to leave you with, before I go into the more theoretical stuff, uh, is that it is very important that we take the context into account, the policy context in particular, for two reasons. First of all, because in the crisis and post-crisis, you know, we're trying to emerge from the crisis. The, word, the term post-crisis does not really reflect where we are. The, the, the image I usually use is the, we are fighting the, the undertow. You know, you know the, the situation where you, you try to, uh, you're in the ocean and you try to get to shore, you have to fight with the undertow. So that's, that's uh, where we are uh, since 2008. To use the policy context for two reasons. Number one, because as we can see from history, Paradigm shifts in economics, as well as in, in other areas, usually uh, come about when the context is propitious, not just in theoretical terms, but also in the application side, in policy terms, basically, when it comes to economics. We knew, we knew, uh, analysts had suggested already back in the 50s and 60s, very uh, stern criticisms against the, the Keynesian model. Until the 70s, the mid to late 70s, when it was hit, the Western world was hit by the Kuwait crisis and the way uh, the response did not really work, I was about to say work, it didn't really work, it was only at that time that those theoretical criticisms that had been levied for more than 20 years uh, actually got uh, to center stage and got the limelight. And it is since the 80s that we have this new, this different paradigm for more than 30 years now, I think it's high time that we give it a, a, a second uh, a look at the way the Keynesian paradigm, if you will, was given uh, since the 70s. Uh, the second reason why looking at the policy context and taking into account is important is because even though the Washington Consensus type uh, policies are the ones that still uh, carry the day within large organizations, like the Commission, for instance, there are alternative approaches uh, that are uh, that have a, an important policy backing too. Uh, for instance, uh, an approach that colleagues of mine and, and myself work uh, in is the so-called smart specialization approach to regional development. That has been embraced full-heartedly by the Director General for Regional Development. And if you look if you look through it and if you if you if you read it carefully it is actually in stark contrast, in juxtaposition to the adjustment programs behind the uh, very heavy, heavy mathematical uh, models that the neo laissez the Washington Consensus, the mainstream model uh, has presented itself and uh, is, is still uh, uh, very popular. Uh, by, by way of example, in the utility functions that are used, and, and the promise of this approach is that Welfare, social welfare is maximized uh, if, you, if you follow this approach. Uh, altruism and envy don't exist. So, individuals, economic agents, are supposed to operate without any uh, sign of envy or altruism. Why? Because if you, if you allow for altruism and envy, it messes up the mathematics tremendously. <laughs> Number one. Number two, and uh, that, that, of course, you would expect, and I guess most of us would expect, what I didn't expect was something that I, I, I had from 
my late uh, advisor Bill Branson, uh, who told me that Moose, Moose was a very important economist in the early 60s, actually the father of rational expectations. Uh, so in a sense, not the sort of person you would expect to, to do the, the work that I'm about to mention now. Moose started toying around with building models in which envy and altruism would be, would be you know, allowed. And what uh, he got, and I don't know if it was, it was ever published, my advisor didn't know, uh, he knew Moose, but he didn't know that that uh, was uh, ever got, uh, published. All goods become public goods. Now, when all goods become public goods, not only the mathematics is very complicated, the politics becomes very complicated. So ideologically speaking, it's something you have to be very careful playing with. Talking about uh, ideologically, uh, you know, and uh, the, the politics of, of things. Uh, a, a huge problem is that the, those theorems, the fundamental theorems of welfare calculus, and all the edifice heavily mathematicized, you know, it, it is usually presented with the convince, uh, the, the persuasion of a ton of equations, uh, is actually, was proved already since the 70s of being unstable in the sense of dynamic instability. And since the, the 80s and 90s, you have more and more theorems uh, proven uh, consolidating that. Actually, uh, Arrow, the Nobel Prize winner in economics, uh, said uh, notoriously about uh, that first theorem proved in the mid-70s that that was a theorem that should not have been proven. It was that devastating. Now, this is something that has been known in theoretical circles for 30, 40 years, but it hasn't percolated into the more practical side, you know, the, the policy uh, conclusions, the policy uh, corollaries, if you will. Um, I'll just mention one more thing, because I think it is important, and it has to do also with the, the it's not theoretical, uh, it has to do with the policy context. Uh, much of the challenge that is uh, facing the uh, dominant model, the Washington Consensus model, actually predates the 2008 crisis. It is clearly the crisis has changed, the game changes, and should be. But it began when productivity growth started faltering. Remember the, the theories and the, you know, the, the hype about a new economy emerging in the 90s with the internet mm -hmm. and all that? Well, that bubble, basically we have had a series of bubbles since the early 80s of different sorts. The technology one in the 90s was one of them. Uh, but the, the hope or the, the, the the hype, if you will, was that we have entered a new economy, and productivity growth had entered a new plateau, a new, uh, not plateau, a new growth path uh, altogether. Now, since the early 2000s, and I'm closing here, we, we know that this was not the case, that the productivity growth we saw in the 90s was limited to ICT-related industries. And more importantly, since the early 2000s, we have productivity growth uh, faltering in the Western world. So the real part of the economy is, is calling us to task. That there, there must be a more serious conversation about things like growth and equality, uh, about where growth and innovation come from, uh, and where do we devote resources uh, in society. I'll stop here.